Then he brought me to the inner court by the south gate, and he measured the south gate. It was of the same size as the others. Its side rooms, its jams, and its vestibule were of the same size as the others, and there were windows round about in it and its vestibule. Its length was 50 cubits, and its breadth 25 cubits. And there were vestibules round about, 25 cubits long and 5 cubits broad. Its vestibule faced the outer court, and palm trees were on its jams, and its stairway had eight steps. Then he brought me to the inner court on the east side, and he measured the gate. It was of the same size as the others. Its side rooms, its jams, and its vestibule were of the same size as the others. And there were windows round about in it and in its vestibule. Its length was 50 cubits and its breadth 25 cubits. Its vestibule faced the outer court and it had palm trees on its jams, one on either side and its stairway had eight steps. Then he brought me to the, no to the north gate and he measured it. It had the same size as the others. Its side rooms, its jams, and its vestibule were of the same size as the others and it had windows round about. Its length was 50 cubits, and its breadth 25 cubits. Its vestibule faced the outer court, and it had palm trees on its jams, one on either side, and its stairway had eight steps. There was a chamber with its door in the vestibule of the gate, where the burnt offering was to be washed. And in the vestibule of the gate were two tables on either side, on which the burnt offering and the sin offering and the guilt offering were to be slaughtered. And on the outside of the vestibule, at the entrance of the north gate, were two tables. And on the other side of the vestibule of the gate were two tables. Four tables were on the inside, and four tables on the outside of the side of the gate. Eight tables on which the sacrifices were to be slaughtered. And there were also four tables of hewn stone for the burnt offering a cubit and a half long, and a cubit and a half broad, and one cubit high, on which the instruments were to be laid with which the burnt offerings and the sacrifices were slaughtered, and hooks a hand breadth long were fastened round about within, and on the tables the flesh of the offering was to be laid. Then he brought me from without into the inner court, and behold, there were two chambers in the inner court, one at the side of the north gate facing south, the other at the side of the south gate facing north. And he said to me, This chamber which faces south is for the priests who have charge of the temple, and the chamber which faces north is for the priests who have charge of the altar. These are the sons of Zadok, who alone among the sons of Levi, Levi may come near to the, nor to the Lord to minister to him. And he measured the court a hundred cubits long and a hundred cubits broad, four square, and the altar was in front of the temple. Then he brought me to the vestibule of the temple and measured the jams of the vestibule, five cubits on either side, and the breadth of the gate was fourteen cubits, and the side walls of the gate were three cubits on either side. The length of the vestibule was twenty cubits, and the breadth twelve cubits, and ten steps led up to it and there were pillars beside the jams on either side. Then he brought me to the nave and measured the jams. On each side, six cubits was the breadth of the jams, and the breadth of the entrance was 10 cubits, and the side walls of the entrance were five cubits on either side. And he measured the length of the nave 40 cubits, and its breadth 20 cubits. Then he went into the inner room and measured the jams of the entrance, two cubits, and the breadth of the entrance, six cubits, and the side walls of the entrance, seven cubits. And he measured the length of the room, 20 cubits, and its breadth, 20 cubits, beyond the nave. And he said to me, this is the most holy place. Then he measured the wall of the temple, six cubits thick, and the breadth of the side chambers, four cubits, round about the temple. And the side chambers were in three stories, one over another, 30 in each story. There were offsets all around the wall of the temple to serve as supports for the side chambers, so that they should not be supported by the wall of the temple. And the side chambers became broader as they rose from story to story, corresponding to the enlargement of the offset from story to story round about the temple. 
On the side of the temple, a stairway led upward, and thus one went up from the lowest story to the top story through the middle story. I saw also that the temple had a raised platform round about. The foundations of the side chambers measured a full reed of six long cubits. The thickness of the outer wall of the side chambers was five cubits, and the part of the platform which was left free was five cubits. Between the platform of the temple and the chambers of the court was a breadth of twenty cubits round about the temple on every side, and the doors of the side chambers opened on the part of the platform that was left free, one door toward the north and another toward the south, and the breadth of the part that was left free was five cubits round about. The building that was facing the temple yard on the west side was seventy cubits broad, and the wall of the building was five cubits thick round about, and its length ninety cubits. Then he measured the temple, a hundred cubits long, and the yard and the building with its walls, a hundred cubits long, also the breadth of the east front of the temple and the yard, a hundred cubits. Then he measured the length of the building facing the yard, which was at the west, and its walls on either side, a hundred cubits. The nave of the temple and the inner room and the outer vestibule were paneled and round about all three had windows with recessed frames. Over against the threshold, the temple was paneled with wood round about from the floor up to the windows. Now the windows were covered. To the space above the door, even to the inner room and on the outside, and on all the walls round about in the inner room and the nave were carved likeness, carved likenesses of cherubim and palm trees, a palm tree between cherub and cherub. Every cherub had two faces, the face of a man toward the palm tree on the one side and the face of a young lion toward the palm tree on the other side. They were carved on the whole temple round about, from the floor to above the door, cherubim and palm trees were carved on the wall. The doorposts of the nave were squared, and in front of the holy place was something resembling an altar of wood, three cubits high, two cubits long, and two cubits broad. Its corners, its base, and its walls were of wood. He said to me, This is the table which is before the Lord. The nave and the holy place had each a double door. The doors had two leaves apiece, two swinging leaves for each door. And on, the do and on the doors of the nave were carved cherubim and palm trees, such as were carved on the walls. And there was a canopy of wood in front of the vestibule outside. And there were recessed windows and palm trees on either side, on the sidewalks, sidewalls of the vestibule. Whoever keeps the law controls his thoughts, and wisdom is the fulfillment of the fear of the Lord. He who is not clever cannot be taught, but there is a cleverness which increases bitterness. The knowledge of a wise man will increase like a flood, and his counsel like a flowing spring. The mind of a fool is like a broken jar. It will hold no knowledge. When a man of understanding hears a wise saying, he will praise it and add to it. When a reveler hears it, he dislikes it and casts it behind his back. A fool's narration is like a burden on a journey, but delight will be found in the speech of the intelligent. The utterance of a sensible man will be sought in the assembly, and they will ponder his words in their minds. Like a house that has vanished, so is wisdom to a fool, and the knowledge of the ignorant is unexamined talk. To a senseless man, education is chains on his feet, and like manacles on his right hand. A fool raises his voice when he laughs, but a clever man smiles quietly. To a sensible man, education is like a golden ornament, and like a bracelet on the right arm. But as for you, teach what befits sound doctrine. Bid the older men be temperate, serious, sensible, sound in faith, in love, and in steadfastness. Bid the older women likewise to be reverent in behavior, not to be slanderers or slaves to drink. They are to teach what is good, and so train the young women to love their husbands and children, to be sensible, chaste, domestic, kind, and submissive to their husbands, that the word of God may not be discredited. Likewise, urge the younger men to control themselves, 
show yourself in all respects a model of good deeds, and in your teaching show integrity, gravity, and sound speech that cannot be censured, so that an opponent may be put to shame, having nothing evil to say of us. Bid slaves to be submissive to their masters, and to give satisfaction in every respect. They are not to talk back, nor to pilfer, but to show entire and true fidelity, so that in everything they may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior. For the grace of God has appeared for the salvation of all men, training us to renounce irreligion and worldly passions, and to live sober, upright, and godly lives in this world, awaiting our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all iniquity and to purify for himself a people of his own, who are zealous for good deeds. Declare these things, exhort and reprove with all authority. Let no one disregard you. Remind them to be submissive to rulers and authorities, to be obedient, to be ready for any honest work, to speak evil of no one, to avoid quarreling, to be gentle, and to show perfect courtesy toward all men. For we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hated by men and hating one another. But when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, he saved us, not because of deeds done by us in righteousness, but in virtue of his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal in the Holy Spirit, which he poured out upon us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior so that we might be justified by his grace and become heirs in hope of eternal life. The saying is sure. I desire you to insist on these things, so that those who have believed in God may be careful to apply themselves to good deeds. These are excellent and profitable to men, but avoid stupid controversies, genealogies, dissensions, and quarrels over the law, for they are unprofitable and futile. As for a man who is factious, after admonishing him once or twice, have nothing more to do with him, knowing that such a person is perverted and sinful. He is self-condemned. When I send Artemis or Tychius to you, do your best to come to me at Nicopolis, for I have decided to spend the winter there. Do your best to speed Zenus, the lawyer, and Apollos on their way. See that they lack nothing and let our people learn to apply themselves to good deeds, so as to help cases of urgent need, and not to be unfruitful. All who are with me send greetings to you. Greet those who love us in the faith. Grace be with you all. In Titus chapters 2 and 3, St. Paul offers us a type of household code which was commonplace in his time. We should be faithful, loving, and temperate. Paul says, and yet obedient to those with higher authority and with greater wisdom. This way of thinking may seem antiquated, and because some of the power structures in our own time are mercifully different from that of the Roman Empire, for example, that of slavery, it can be easy to pass over these words. However, we can benefit from the wisdom that constructs the household code because this code encourages us to respect and learn from those with greater experience and responsibility. As Sirach tells us, it is only the fool who refuses to hear the words of the wise, and the fool views education as a chain upon him. We must not be too proud to learn from anyone, even those with authority over us, whom we might be tempted to undervalue, such as a boss, parent, or teacher. Ezekiel, who is used to proclaiming the very word of God, remains entirely silent throughout his tour of the new temple in Jerusalem and listens to him who has been given greater authority. Do you ever refuse to listen to a superior simply because you dislike that they have some authority over you?